I didn't realize there are generations who do not know about the origins of film. At the beginning of the decade, Scorsese took a serious interest in documentary filmmaking. I remember going to the Lowy's Commodore. It's now gone, like most of the old theaters are. A Letter to Elia is the biography of Elia Kazan, Martin's favorite director. It spoke to me in a way that no one else I knew in my life seemed to be able to do. Fun fact, Kazan's final film, The Last Tycoon, starring Robert De Niro, was released the same year as Taxi Driver. My life has taken another turn again. Despite his brilliant films, Elliot was considered a controversial figure among the creative circles. In 1952, at a meeting of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, he identified eight actors as being members of the Communist Party, of which he himself was a member in the 1930s. The names he provided were blacklisted in Hollywood and destroyed the careers of those individuals. Half a century later, Elliot received an honorary Academy Award, but some of those in attendance refused to applaud, while others chose not to stand. But Scorsese's narrative focused on the director's work, which is filled with masterpieces of world cinema. A film director has to get a shot no matter what he does. We're desperate people, and one way or another, no matter what we have to do, we'll do it. That same year, Scorsese got scooped up by the HBO channel for work in television. He first shot a biopic of the writer Fran Lebowitz, famous for her poignant, caustic commentary on public life. I mean, here's the problem of being ahead of your time. By the time everyone gets around to it, you're bored. Martin and Fran quickly became friends. Both grew up in New York and reveled in the magic of the great city. Walking in New York is a mode of transport. That's how I get around. I walk everywhere. Well, Leibowitz's story once again confirmed the director's reputation as an encyclopedia of cinematic knowledge. You know in the third scene in that Buster Keaton movie where he's looking in the candy store? And I would say, no, I don't know that. And then he would show you the movie. But HBO wasn't going to let Scorsese go. His next project turned out to be much more difficult. Following the completion of The Sopranos, the show's executive producer, Terrence Winter, was looking for an idea for a new show. The book Boardwalk Empire and the rights to it was presented to him by Mark Wahlberg. The actor told him that if the project interested him, the job was his. Scorsese had agreed to become a producer. The director was very interested in the only period of American crime history that he had not yet portrayed on screen. Winter wrote the screenplay, and Martin agreed to help cast, produce, and direct the pilot episode. Not as good as you, Bundle. Good evening, Nucky. Hey, how are you? How are you, Nucky? The lead role was played by Steve Buscemi, with whom Martin had worked on New York stories. I'd be honored to name my child after you. Enoch, you couldn't possibly be so cruel. The show features a star-studded cast, but given Scorsese's filmography, Michael Stolbarg deserves special recognition for playing Arnold Rothstein, the gangster after whom the main character of Casino was named. I'm a skilled player is what he means. The project's scope was unprecedented in the TV world. HBO spent $5 million building the set for Atlantic City's main strip. The director even made sure that the floorboards were consistent with what was used in that era. Another $5 million was spent on costumes, not to mention the steep fees for the lead actors. When the director invited the actors to improvise, the producers almost had heart attacks. In television, any deviation from the script is considered taboo. You young fellas, no appreciation for the art of conversation. The pilot episode had a budget of over $18 million, a record which HBO itself broke while filming the series The Pacific and Westworld. Martin didn't stop at directing the first episode. He continued to make edits to the script and rough cuts of most of the episodes. Upon its release, Boardwalk Empire became the channel's biggest overnight success, but only for a year. The show lasted five full seasons, although Winter said that he was prepared to shoot until he had chronicled 50 years of American gangster history. He 
Even before filming for Boardwalk Empire began, Scorsese was approached by the widow of George Harrison, lead guitarist of the Beatles. After watching Martin's documentary about Bob Dylan, Olivia realized that he was the only director she could trust to film a biography about her late husband. Moreover, Martin had actually met George 30 years earlier on the set of The Last Waltz. To turn down the opportunity to shoot a biography of such a great musician would have been a serious mistake, especially since Olivia Harrison was granting access to George's private collection, which contained memorabilia, letters, unreleased videos, and home movies. The film tells Harrison's life story as he pursued spirituality, amateur race car driving, philanthropy, and meaning as one of the four people who had changed the world forever. <laughs> Martin had honored the musical world with a magnificent film, but the time had come to show his true feelings towards his first love. cinema. Interestingly, the director was prompted to do this by his youngest daughter. Francesca introduced her father to Brian Selznick's novel, The Invention of Hugo Cabret, and asked him to make a movie based on it, preferably in 3D. It only took a couple of minutes for Martin to be won over by the artistic retelling of the lives of cinematic pioneer, Georges Méliès. The main character was based on Georgia, who had shot more than 500 films. The most famous of these was the first ever sci-fi film called A Trip to the Moon. But his business went under, thanks in no small part to Thomas Edison, who had closed the American movie market to Milliers, having gone broke. The director burned most of his films and became a toy seller. It wasn't until 1932 that his contribution to cinema was finally acknowledged when the global film community had managed to find Georgia. As the founder of the charity for the recovery and restoration of rare and old films, Martin had already fallen in love with the plot. When he found out that the author of the novel was Brian Selznick, a relative of David Selznick, screenwriter of the first film that he had ever taken his mother to, he no longer had any doubts as to the project that he would work on next. It didn't hurt that he had finally found funding to shoot Silence. But this new film forced him to postpone the religious drama, which after 10 years was already seeming like a pipe dream. The rights to Hugo had been purchased even before the book was published, and Scorsese's interest significantly accelerated the process. The story was adapted for the screen by John Logan, a partner in The Aviator, while Robert Richardson again took his seat behind the camera. And so the great adventure began. The film's new format had both the director and the cinematographer worried. The colleagues had two options. Either shoot the film the old-fashioned way and convert it to 3D in post-production, or shoot it in compatible 3D format from the very beginning. Martin turned to James Cameron for advice, who insisted on the second option. To better understand the specifics of how this would work, Scorsese and Richardson spent two weeks studying modern film technology at Cameron's production company. After a trial screening of the film, James would go on to call it a masterpiece with the best 3D cinematography in history, including his own films. It's absolutely the best 3D photography that, that I've seen. Casting, for once, turned out to be an enjoyable experience. They first found two talented kids. Went into a dark room. And on a white screen, he saw a rocket fly into the eye of the man in the moon. While Hugo would be as a Butterfield's cinematic debut in a leading role, Chloe Grace Moritz had already won the hearts of moviegoers in films like 500 Days of Summer and Kick-Ass. Next to join the project were Shutter Island actors Ben Kingsley. Magic tricks and illusion became my speciality. The world of imagination. And Emily Mortimer as well as the previously mentioned Boardwalk Empire hero, Michael Stahlberg. It is a masterpiece. 
Sasha Baron Cohen was called in to play the role of the inspector. I would like to direct this movie. I think Martin is doing an awful job at it. Scorsese admired the actor's talent and pictured him in the role immediately as he read the book. Seems Maximilian doesn't like the cut of your jib, little man. He is disturbed by your physiognomy. Cohen joined the cast with a dozen ideas, most of which were thrown out because the jokes were deemed inappropriate for children. And then my false leg would fly out into the audience. But then we realized that actually the kids would be freaked out by that. Hold the train! Oh! Oh! Help! Help! Assistance! Oh! Hold it! Hold it! Despite the fact that the film is set in Paris, a significant portion was actually shot in London. So having the British acting elite involved in the project should come as no surprise. Francis de la Torre, Richard Griffiths, and Helen McCrory are names that have never disappeared from theater posters in England. You were an actress. Well, a long time ago, children. And then, of course, came Christopher Lee, with whom the director had maintained a cordial relationship for 20 years but could never find a project that he felt suited the seasoned talent. I always felt that my career would not be absolutely complete unless I did a film with Martin Scorsese. Filming lasted three months, a couple weeks of which were spent in Paris. One of the film's notable features is its layering of visual illusions, ranging from high-tech depth effects to magic, card tricks, sequences from Millier's films. Cameos by Martin and Ben Kingsley's son, as well as historical cameos. The king of the gypsy guitar, Django Reinhardt, can be seen playing in the cafe scene. And among his audience, the artist Salvador Dali and writer James Joyce. What? The automaton is the recreation of a mechanism based on inventions by Jacques Cadreau in 1768, which is still capable of drawing pictures no less complex than those shown in the film. Nevertheless, the lion's share of Hugo relied on computer animation. One opening camera sequence was designed before filming began, with the final rendering not being ready until a year later. But the $150 million love letter to cinema turned out to be a commercial fiasco, as the payoff for Paramount Pictures ended up being less than $200 million. Nevertheless, not only did the film receive favorable reviews from critics, Hugo virtually stole the show at the annual awards ceremony. Scorsese won the Golden Globe for Best Director, and the film received 11 Oscar nominations two months later, winning five. The Academy praised the sound, set, visual effects, and cinematography, earning Robert Richardson his third Oscar. Know the rest. It's enough poetry for today. Hey, do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.